and like F1 pilots, like MotoGP guys, like they are probably the closest analogs to the, the competitive gamer in terms of like, certainly there's more physical toll on their bodies in, in there, but in terms of like cognitive performance and the amount of like actions per minute that they're making and all of the quick decisions that they're doing, it's, it's quite, quite similar. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Ariel, thank you so much for sharing with us. I don't know if anybody else has any questions, but you can always maybe send it in chat. I want to be conscious of your time, but also some of the other people. That yeah. You're drawn in. And cool. And I'll put my email in the chat too, if anybody wants to reach out. Oh, perfect. And just maybe verbally, like what's the best way to get in touch with you? Just email Ariel at choosemuse.com. Choosemuse.com. That in the chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. We were excited to have you and it's been awesome. My pleasure. A lot of fun. So what do you think? On who's next? Let's talk to Justin. Justin. Yeah. I just want to check Justin and Andrani. Does anybody have a hard stop? I'm I'm good. So Justin, oh. can go ahead. Justin, are you awesome. okay? Do you want to? All right, cool. I'll, I'll let you introduce. All Justin. right. Um, it's perfect because Ryan and Matt Fitzpatrick are on, and it's actually through Ryan that I had the chance to meet Justin Williams, and so. Justin, oh. <laughs> here he is. I'm going to just do a quick introduction. I actually feel like I became fast friends with you when I first met you. It was the 4th of July. We were hanging out on WebEx slash Zoom, and I was learning a lot about just how you are a pioneer, not only as a cyclist, which we'll get into your career, but to be the first Black owner of a professional cycling team called Legion... LA, I'm going to call it that. Um, and so, and I know that Ryan and Matt have some common interests, which is how we met. But I think what you're doing is phenomenal in terms of just being the first to really um, make it make a difference for people. And I think that's the theme that I had from when I first met you, how it's not only now in what you're doing as a leader in cycling, but how you've lived your life. And so I would love to just introduce you to the group and have you talk about like, where are you from and how you even got into cycling? So nope, let's start no there. pressure, Justin. Yeah. We just want to know how you're an example for all of humanity. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up in South Central uh, LA, uh, typical um, kind of not the best neighborhood um, and went to Crenshaw High School, which was not a very good high school, but uh, all of my cousins went there and I wanted to be with my family members. So I went there um, and it was, yeah, it was rough growing up. Um, I played football and basketball, so I had a like very good understanding of team and teamwork um, and, and I, wanting to be professional in those sports kind of painted this picture of what a professional athlete was for me. And then I got into cycling. My parents are from Belize, which is a small Caribbean country in Central America. Um, and cycling, believe it or not, is the, one of the biggest sports uh, in that country. Uh, it's incredible. There's this race called the Holy Saturday Cross Country Classic, which is one of the oldest running uh, cycling events in the world. Um, and it's 144 miles. It goes from the coast of Belize to the border of Mexico and back, um, which is incredible. But like the, the experience of the race is, you know, it's been this thing that my family has talked about uh, since I was a kid and I didn't really understand what it meant or what it was until I started getting older. Um, so I got hurt in football. My mom didn't want me to play because of, you know, everything that's going on with football. Um, Brain injury? I got, <laughs> <laughs> and I got hurt and she was like, you know what, maybe not. <laughs> so then my dad, uh, my dad rode bikes and I was, I had gone to a couple of races and I had saw a junior race, and I was like, ah, I could probably beat these, these guys. I was good at football, so I figured it was another sport. And I, and I started riding, and my dad made me wait. He had a, a – we have indoor trainers. Um, so I got on my dad's indoor trainer, and he, he wouldn't let me go ride outside for two months. So he tested me for two months to figure out wow. if I wanted to do it or not. Because cycling is not cheap, and it's not one of those things where, like um, – where you can get in and decide you don't want to do it. Bikes cost thousands of dollars. Um, and plus it was his thing, you know, he was going to let me into his hobby. <laughs> and we had had a shaky relationship when I was growing up just because my dad grew up really rough in, in a third world country, basically. 
Um, so we just didn't have a lot of things that we related on. And that all really changed when I got into cycling. Um, and I started racing. He took me on a 70 mile ride for my first ride out, which was ridiculous. Wow, that's brutal. <laughs> yeah, you got it. I didn't make it all the way. It was, uh, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, my aunt ended up having to pick me up and she took me to get food. And that's my memory of that day. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but then I started winning and I started traveling and I started meeting people and it opened up my mind um, that cycling was, or sorry, that football or basketball wasn't the only way out of this situation that yeah. we had. It wasn't the only and even meeting people within the cycling um, community, it created this thing where I knew that I could be more than what like society had maybe put in front of me or showed me that where I was going. Um, so then I started cycling. And if you know anything about cycling, it's just this crazy, it's pre this sport that's predominantly white sport, white male sport. Um, so, you know, after I started getting really good and I started winning races and I made the national team, I started running into these odd problems, I'll say. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and as a kid, you know, my life had been changed and I was, I was so in love with the traveling, um, and the, like the nice bikes and, and going to these, these really popular events where you're, you know, flying around corners at 30 miles an hour and just so much adrenaline happening and this crashes. And, and, and at the end of the day, I was one of the guys that was winning a good percentage of these. So, you know, beyond all of the, the things that were not so great, there was a lot of great moments. Um, and I, and I turned pro when I was 17. Wow. I continued being pro. I continued being pro till I was like 25. Um, and then it just, it felt like nothing was moving and nothing was changing. And, and I started growing up as a, as a person and developing as a man and looking at this platform that had everything that a successful sporting franchise needed to be successful, yet it wasn't growing or moving forward. And then I started thinking, like, I'm this professional athlete, but what, is that, what does that mean? Like I wasn't being utilized as far as marketing. I wasn't yeah. put, being put in front of kids to inspire them. We weren't changing anything. We weren't doing anything. Um, so I decided to do it on my own, <laughs> which was, <laughs> in hindsight, when I when I thought about it, it was just me being stubborn. Uh, I have I have that problem of if I think something, I don't care if other people think something is possible yeah. or not. Um, if, I, if I'm seeing all of the pieces and they just need to be connected, I'm just going to go for it. So I spent a year on my own. And that year, I won more races than I ever won. Uh, I won two national titles. Um, I got to travel the world. And in cycling, when you travel, you're typically, you fly in, you get ready for the race, you do the race, and then you go back to your hotel room and pack up so that you can leave to the other place. You don't really get to enjoy these yeah. amazing places you travel to. Uh, and the year I spent on my own, I would fly in early. I would go hang out with friends in the area. I would meet friends. I would go do great dinners. I would look up what the best restaurants in the area was. And I really got to enjoy kind of what all of these things that cycling mm -hmm. had to bring. I really got to enjoy that. So the final following year, I was like, okay, let me see if I can start a team um, and I could give these opportunities to other other people that deserve them um and, and i went to all of my sponsors and they were super excited about me telling them instead of giving me four bikes i need you to give me 20 bikes <laughs> um but we started this team um and you know the mission of the team was obviously to create this to switch the environment um that cycling kind of operates in like i think it's, it has this elite, elitist kind of attitude to it because anybody can come in and buy you know a, yeah. a twelve thousand dollar bike and it's the same exact bike that someone that's worked their whole life has right so there's this kind of mental thing that comes with that and it was you know we're going to change that we're going to change the environment especially for people of color that maybe didn't feel like they had a space to to live uh within the sport um we wanted to inspire the next generation of kids and we wanted to make the sport look like something that you would want to be a part of. We wanted to create this, this image and show off this lifestyle that a lot of people don't know come with 
cycling. Like in America, we're heavy in what is what is called criterium racing, which is basically just the circuit. You know, they pick out a mile course in the middle of a city, uh, and we just rip around it as like yeah. fast. Go. <laughs> That's your deal, though, right? It's generally not a popular yeah. sport in North America. Right? No, it's not. But it has all of the it has all of the, the tools that you need to be extremely popular. We have a, a, a governing body in USA Cycling who just doesn't find value in it. They want to, they're trying as hard as they can to be European. Yeah. And yeah. European way. Um, and we're just, you know, European cycling has its own, it's, it's amazing, but it has so many of its own issues. And it's so steeped in culture that they're, they refuse to change anything about it. Um, and it's just not a model that can scale, right? Every team is, 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 is named after whatever sponsor they have instead yeah. of being the Los Angeles Lakers or Los Angeles Clippers or New York Knicks. It's like team whatever presented by whatever. Right. Sure. Every time that team changes. Then they have a new name. Have a new right. name you're a new team. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's like you're not going to go start a team and think you're going to compete against the LA Lakers. 100%. So you're, you're dealing with an incumbent you know, this is not a new sport in Europe, obviously. Right. So it's but a big challenge to do that. It's amazing. I think because you, you do bring up you a point that, yeah, to do that, right? that yeah. North America, you can actually transform what cycling can be in North America from a professional sports standpoint. But I'm really curious because I think what's very specific about what you're doing is that you're doing something that no one has done before, which is to have this minority, not completely, but majority minority I'll just say that oh, your team. cycling team so tell us about like how you got there like what how did you make that happen yeah no it was just me and my my younger brother um have been the best criterium racers in yeah. America for maybe the, the last three years so we just built it we just built a team that complemented like our talents basically and we um and we just basically took that show on the road right we um gave these guys that needed an opportunity at home um, and you could feel the buy-in from that, right? Um, so then we, we traveled around the country um, really spending time and take, like a lot of teams won't engage the public and we went out of our way. We not only wanted to engage the public, we created these events outside of the race for them to show up to and just come say hi and hang out and talk to their favorite guys. I'm not going to be everybody's favorite guy, but like you know, Corey will be or, or Hunter will be or other guys on the team. So we just created something that was different and stood outside of the norm um, and really wanted to, and really went out of our way to engage the cycling public and make them feel like we really appreciate their support and we want to make sure that we make time for them. Um, and that's been massively successful in kind of getting people inspired to not only uh, cheer for us and root for our team, but to get out on their bikes and, and kind of try to get, have some of that fun that the team really uh, like puts out there. What's, I think one of the big challenges in, to your sport overall is the fact that it's not like it's in a venue and you kind of hit it where it's like, you know, they pick a closed circuit and yeah. the monetization of sports traditionally is around either butts and seats or te like television, right? So I'm, I'm curious what your thing is American racing, right? Like we, we're talking about redefining what successful yeah, looks exactly. like yes. in America and, and, and how we can take the sport of cycling and take what we learned from the European model and apply it to American to, to the American market in a way that's going to make sense for us as people. So criterion racing, it's like you can block all, like you see at the Long, uh, Long Beach Grand Prix, with uh, um, F1 cars like or race cars they block off a massive chunk of that and they monetize it it's, it's not impossible you just have to build it in a way that makes sense right so that's that's why we think of a criterion racing is the future of cycling is because you can build those courses they're a mile long you know what I mean you can create something like how you, what you see in um in dirt bike racing where they have a pit and people can pay for VIP and walk through the pits. Like all of that's possible. It's just finding someone that actually has the vision um, and understanding of how the, the sport works and, and how to, and where to monetize things. I think, you know, people being able to walk up and, and look, at, look at cycling in their city and just go watch. I think that being free is always gonna be a thing, 
But I think building courses that you, you can put on TV and, and can be shot from a perspective that's really exciting. If you look at any of our videos on YouTube, it kind of changes the perspective of what cycling is because it's not, it's not riding through the Alps right. uh, and, and doing all that. It's literally, you're flying around these corners and there's, there's barriers. Like if you get the corner wrong, it's a barrier or hay bale. <laughs> it's not, it's not like... I, th I think what's neat, it would be interesting to see, actually, Rab joined, I think, we should get you to connect with him and talk to the mayor of Garden Grove. Maybe we can do the, the Grove. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Close buddies with Rab. Right. I think you guys should meet because Rab grew up in, in South Central oh, LA as well I didn't think of that. when he was a young boy in NWA. But, you know, I, I want to reflect on something that you just said. I know Michael got into the whole professional aspect of cycling, but I think about the the human aspect of what you are trying to do and cycling being an elitist sport and how you're trying to change the game by being more inclusive. I'm going to nerd out for a little bit because that's kind of what I do. But I think about, you know, what we are experiencing, you know, outside of life and hanging out with Michael. I do live in a corporation. And right now it is all about um, enlightening people. Some people are now finally waking up and saying, huh, maybe it is time to be a diverse organization and be more inclusive of our people, meaning engage with everybody, include them in every good thing you're trying to do as a company, because you know what, you might even innovate even more and grow your company. And so I'm fascinated with how what you're trying to do with society, and I'll say one more thing and I'll stop pontificating and I'll ask a question, but I think about like the future leaders of this world. You know, it's Gen Z, it's next gen, and the way um, the, the, the young people who are now coming into the workplace, so they're 16, right? And they're coming into the workplace and what they're looking for is not following rules. What they're looking for is to learn and grow and to engage with, you know, their leaders, the people around them. And so I think about what you're doing is awesome for just society in general and for the world of cycling. But since you've got a cross section of folks here who are also living in businesses like, like I am, like, what advice do you have for leaders to take a chance on, on people, you know, and how do you, how do you innovate organizations? Yeah, I, I just feel like it's, it's about listening. I think that's a lot of the younger generation want to be heard. I, I even grew up, I feel like I grew up in the middle where, you know, you were supposed to just listen and, and a respect and appreciate the fact that people above you had more experiences. And I think there's, obviously there's something in that, right? Like those yeah. people, do, the older generations do have more experiences. They have seen more, but I think the way we communicate that and the way we take on and listen to the concerns of the younger generation, the, the, the fact of the matter is like these kids are growing up and they want to be heard. And, and if they're not heard, then they'll just ignore any advice. They don't yeah. care. If, they don't care if it's good advice or not. If it's like this like tit for tat thing, like if you respect them, you're going to get that respect in return. And if you don't, um, you, you're, they're either going to be miserable working under you or they're going to go away at some point. And I think that's communication right now is like the utmost important thing, listening and, and very much paying attention, uh, maybe swallowing a little bit of, of pride and, and, and taking the time to just try to understand where people are coming from, those, that younger generation is coming from. Um, because it's, it's hard when you see a lot of kids facing so many mental problems and a lot of it has to do with, you know, them not being heard, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and that just kind of perpetuates this, this cycle of, you know, them not wanting to, to take the advice, even if it's good advice. Well, maybe they shouldn't take the advice. Maybe they shouldn't. <laughs> but I think forever, like change comes from people that are like, "That's a stupid idea." I have another idea. I mean, that's literally where I live. <laughs> like, uh, that's, I'm like, none of this makes any sense. I'm not doing it, and just refusing to uh, conform to that. Right? Like, you know, being a black male in America, like my life has been conforming and, and trying to be non-threatening. And the moment I stepped away and was like, "Nah." This is this is ridiculous. I'm not doing it anymore. Like everything with the Legion started to kind of snowball. Um, That's amazing. There's always someone to tell you to obey. But. Well, I know. I think what I, I love just... though, and why I just so 
so like felt simpatico with you, Justin, is that until you become your authentic self and living your full life, meaning being exactly who you are, then I think that's when you're going to experience what you define as your own success, not how people define you. Exactly. And so, um, and I relate to that so much. I mean, we talked a lot about this, but also being first generation, my parents are from the Philippines and English was a second language in our home. And when we left the home, and when I say left the home in kindergarten to go to school, my mom and dad would say, only speak English, we want you to fit in, listen and learn. And so a lot of my life has been assimilating and trying to fit in, but then I realized, how about if I was just me and then do it my way? It's just, a, life is a lot easier, right? And you may have some challenges, but, um, I think a lot more happens as a result of it. So anyway, that's why yeah. I'm so excited to meet you. No, and for me, obviously, there's a there's a balance. I feel like we we definitely have a problem in America where everyone wants to do things so much their own way that they kind of start to leave other people out. Um, but I think there's a balance, right? Like me being able to be my authentic self, um, but still also be a good person and understand the the, the society that we live in and the, and what's wrong and right, right? What's okay. Right and learning from people like you and learning from people that come along that are willing to teach like that's also something right you have to be stubborn in what you want but you have to be understanding and how you're going to get there I don't know everything I don't know everything about business I don't know everything about cycling um, but I, I'm a really fast learner and I think that's what's helped me be so successful is like having an absolute understanding of where I want to see cycling go but not being so stubborn in the fact that some people are going to come along that have more experience than me in a lot of areas. And I have to be willing to like learn and take the, those nuggets of information and apply them in a way that, again, the experiences that I've had with cycling and, and understanding the culture and the history of cycling, uh, applying all of the, that information to those things to make it work for everyone. Yeah, I love, I love what you're doing. It's awesome. There's probably a lot of room for innovation and opportunity. Right. And well, I guess how can, don't, yeah. Don't conform. How can we um, <laughs> That's help you? That's my only yeah. advice. <laughs> how, how can we help you? Like, yeah, how does can anybody this have any community help you? Too. And if anyone has any questions for Justin, too. Anybody want to sponsor on. a cycling team? Yeah. Yeah, anybody want to sponsor a cycling team? Exactly. Um, step one was creating the Legion of Los Angeles and figuring out how a franchise should look and operate. Um, teams really suck right now, honestly. Like, it's, I have a lot of friends that are trying to come to my team, but if everyone comes to my team, then we can't know who we're going to race. <laughs> um, so, you know, step one was creating franch a franchise. The step two is, is creating multiple franchises and starting to expand that portfolio of teams, right? So having the Legion of Los Angeles, having a team in New York, maybe a team in San Francisco, um, and once we start to develop, once we get the money to start to develop different teams, then we can kind of manipulate what the race circuit, circuit looks like within USA Cycling. And then we can move into events. And then when we start throwing our own events, then we can figure out what those events are supposed to look like, so on and so forth. And then eventually we'll get to the point where USA Cycling won't be relevant for us anymore because sure. we'll, have, we'll have our own events, we'll have our own teams, we'll have all of the power um, and then once we have all the power and it's under one roof, we can start to really create something that looks like a MotoGP where, you know, there's 15, or 15 uh, race series with the t all of our teams and we can start to sell TV rights and we start to get massive sponsorships and all of that other stuff. So leading to Los Angeles is step one. We've been a team for a year and a half. I think we ha we're on our way to 60,000 followers on Instagram. Um, you know, we we're, we have a global reach where we're, you know, I think London is our second biggest demographic of following. Um, so I think we're doing a lot of things right. It's just being patient, um, continuing to build out um, slowly but smart. And again, paying attention, listening and learning to people coming in. Um, I don't know if there's anything yeah. else you want to add. I, the one thing I was just going to ask, which I don't want to spend a lot of time on, but is obviously you need like these lighthouse type events. But I, I feel like, in, I mean, as I've worked in hockey a long time, and the future of any sport is the kids. Uh, early where they're picking a sport is probably really important. So I'm curious 
what that's like at what point people adopt it and what do you think a realistic way to get the kids uh, so we do a, I do a lot of I am do a lot of um, outreach with this company called Outride. Uh, it's a special foundation. Uh, we basically go into schools and talk to kids about how racing bike, how it looks racing bikes, what the circuits look like. We show them videos. Uh, one of my friends does wheelies. Uh, that's a great, great way to get them in. Um, we're trying to figure out ways to engage, and that's on the middle school, elementary school level. Um, NICA is massive. Uh, the, it's like a high school mountain bike league uh they have massive numbers as far as like participants and it's just getting those kids exposed to criterion racing like we're going to throw a race next year in october uh in laverne and one of the races that we're going to have is a, is a nika mountain bike race on a crit circuit which is something that has never been done um and we're going to do junior events we're going to do the nika race and then we're going to do a regular junior road race and we're going to have specialized basically bring out a demo fleet of bikes and those Nike kids that came on to race their mountain bikes will be able to participate also in the road event because we'll have bikes for them to use. So that's how we plan on engaging. I think the perfect case situation is like, you know, having kids do like push. I did, you start cycling at 10 is when you can start doing road bikes, 9, 10. Um, but even if we can get kids earlier in trying to get them around uh, running tracks, because those are everywhere on their bikes and doing racing laps around running tracks. Mm-hmm. A way, way where we can like take a step toward getting kids into the sport at an earlier age. I love it. Excellent. I think Mike Miller is on and he has a question. So Mike, introduce yourself. I, I, my name is Mike Miller. I have known Michael and Marisa for a very long time. And I know Justin, we've been in, been in contact uh, a little bit via email. It's really great to have an opportunity to, to hear you um, today. And I guess, you know, being from, uh, you know, kind of right next door, sort of like, you know, right by Downey and, uh, you know, over there by the, by the uh, um, 710 and all those freeways over by like, by South Central, I think you were like from, from, from 33rd. What's the reaction in, in the, in the, in the neighborhood? Like, I mean, are, are, do you find, um, are they supportive of what you're doing or is there resistance now? Where I'm from, even when I first started, it was always like, you know, anybody that's from the hood, right, and is, is doing something that's outside of it that is inherently positive, there's always, like, a lot of positive feedback. Like, I would get – people would wave to me that I obviously would not ne- know nothing about, right? Um, I think that, you know, it, it's hope, right? And all I am is hope. You know, if I could have ended up, like, a number of other people that I, that I know – um, and all and, and cycling gave me hope. And I think that's the first step in getting kids from my area to kind of snap out of this trance of, well, this is where I'm going. Oh, well, there's no opportunity where this, this and that. Like cycling is something that is not only help, helps you be more healthy, not only this like really positive mental space and clarity when you're out on your bike. It's Im- Trust me, it's impossible to be mad when you're suffering on a bike. It's, it's just, it's, it's very humbling. So changing that mindset of these kids uh from my area is um is, is the most important thing and then after that you can get them to to focus on their schoolwork you can get them to to look at the world from a different perspective and not be so cynical about what their odds are um so you know it's just exposing them once you expose them everyone understands that it's something different and it's something cool they just don't know how to get into it and or if they do get into it they don't feel like they belong and that, and that's what we're really focusing on changing gotcha you're you're you're, you're peddling hope in all the best way man <laughs> again i got that one that awesome <laughs> <laughs> well uh all right well, well i think we'll chat with you at some point this week but thanks man thanks mike i don't know if you want to yeah or? any other questions for justin hey, i have a question if you don't mind just yeah Hi, jacob jacob go ahead and introduce yourself um, I'm Jacob. I'm Mike's son. This is my sister, Jaden. Hi. Um, so when you were like really racing all the time, what did what did training look like for you? Like, what what, what was the purpose of practice serve? Say that one more time. Sorry, I missed it. What was your training schedule like? Was it pretty rigorous when you were racing all the time? Yeah. So so criteriums are not like the Tour de France, right? They're not you know 21 days of four and a, four hours plus of riding. Criteriums are an hour and a half of 
literally as hard as you can go and you're trying to like play this chess match at 30 miles an hour and your heart rate's like 180 beats per minute um the training for that is a little bit different than what the tour is the tour guys will have to ride 30 hours a week plus gym plus they they have to eat very specifically criterion racing is maybe 20 hours a week plus like five four to five hours of gym so you it's it's really intense training. It's a little. It gives you a little more time to be human, um, which is which is awesome. So like during the off season, training is you know you wake up, you know you do yoga or you do meditation, whatever you do in the morning for yourself. You do some stretching. Uh, you go out and ride whatever your workout is. Uh, you come back and then you have the day for yourself. Um, and and that's pretty much what it is. It's for me, it's, I'm so used to it because I've been doing it since I was 13. It doesn't feel like a ton of work. It just feels like something that I do, like brushing my teeth. You know what I mean? It's just something that happens. So it doesn't feel super rigorous. But I, it, if that's my perspective, I'm sure, like, if you're just starting it, it, it is, right? It takes a long – I've been doing it for 17 years. It takes a longer time uh, if you're just getting started to kind of get to that point where your body's in cruise control. Thank you. No worries, man. So, Justin, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, you can email me. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, you can email me. I'm always on Instagram. Social media is a massive part of, like, what we do and kind of how we try to engage uh, people that follow us. Um, Instagram is always great. Uh, and I'll drop my email in the chat. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an awesome story. Can I ask one quick question, if that's cool? Oh, so who is asking? Matt. Yeah, sure. Oh. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Hey, um, so uh, we live in Crenshaw. I teach up the road at Fauche, not not Crenshaw High, but I teach high school. I went to middle school. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I was a middle school teacher, middle high school teacher there last year and just high school this year. But um, I'm like the health teacher, the physiology teacher. And I just want to like first say thank you for acknowledging like giving students voice, right? You, they they want to be heard so desperately you know, in the time that we're in and it's just so evident in everything that's going on and what they tell me that like, they're so yearning for like being heard and doing things differently. But I have a bunch of students, you know, that like last year were like, how do I get involved? Whether it's, you know, they're into running. And so like, I could kind of direct them towards like the, the students run LA marathon kind of resources. But I have a bunch of students who are, you know, aspiring cyclists and bikers and are like really intrigued about that world. And given the situation that we're in i can't tell them to like go out and go to a physical space is there is there a resource that you would recommend for me to direct them to just to kind of give them some more opportunity to know what options they have when we're allowed to go back in the world again yeah um the we're gonna do we've put together three junior day camps for next year and it'll be open invite to anyone that wants to come out and kind of ride it'll be uh, broken into like an hour two hour three hours um so i'll get obviously with everything going on we're still in the middle to the midst of planning everything uh those will be awesome and then with those there'll be a lot of bike shops there and bike shops basically run junior, junior teams um for the LA area, there's two teams that stand out to me. Major Motion uh, is a team that I grew up on. Uh, that's the team that developed me and developed like, you know, some of the best riders in the country. Um, and then there's another uh, cycling junior team called Los Angeles Bicycle Academy. Um, and they're also basically the guy, the guy when I was younger, the two guys are now running different programs, but they're doing the same thing. So LA Bicycle Academy and Major Motion would be the two kind of uh, junior teams to reach out to. And then our team basically takes our old equipment and we'll, we donate that to those junior teams. So like we, they have equipment to give a kid that wants to try racing or riding. Awesome. Thank you so much. Maurice. Can I ask a quick question? It's Barbara here in Austin. Oh, sure. Barbara, go ahead. Hi, um, Justin, thank you so much for sharing. Um, you've said a couple of things that absolutely resonated with me to tell me I'm on the right track. So I do appreciate your, your authentic self. I just love it. And do you have any plans on coming to Austin? I didn't hear if you were already branching out yet, but any programs in Austin? Because Austin, I believe, needs two things. I think it needs a new face of cycling because we're a little embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> as you can imagine. And, and just really nothing has filled that void. I find that fascinating because there's so many international cyclists here. And second, we need color, honey. We need color badly. We need to bring in more color into the city. It's just too white for my tastes. It's just not spicy enough. So if you wouldn't mind coming to Austin. I'll, I'll take you up on that. There's a, uh, a group uh, a group of races in Austin called the Drive Driveway Series. Okay. Uh, I'm definitely coming to show Austin that California runs crits. So I'll, I'll <laughs> I love it. <laughs> good, good. Well, I, I would love to, um, if, if you're coming and you have an opportunity to speak or need an opportunity, not, not that I, I'm pretty connected, but um, I just think that you have something for uh, the kids here to, to listen to. And I've got some people to plug into. If It sounds like you've, you're well plugged in the cycling world, but as far as the nonprofit kind of thing going on, especially with children. Um, yeah, I'd just love to know if you're here. So. Uh, I could let you know. Um, I think Excellent. The, it's concluded for this year, but they do four or five races a year. So next year, um, whenever we put them on our schedule, wherever we put Austin on our schedule, um, for sure, would love to yeah. kind of come early and do something with you. Um, yeah. Invite some of those kids to the race because racing is cycling is weird and like I can explain criteriums until my until my face turns blue, but like until you step out and like feel the energy that. Comes mm. Like twenty guys like riding around at thirty miles an hour and people banging on the the barriers. It's just something different, and people just don't know it even exists. And like that's a part of the problem, right? That's what we're trying to change. So I'd love to come out um, and do something. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for everything you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, great question. And great. Hey, Mike and Marissa. Hey, set it up hey. offline. I heard you. Hey <laughs> friends, what's up, my friend? I'm here. And whatever Justin needs, I got you. I got your back. Hey man, I appreciate it. I love it. I love it. Well, one good thing is that you can't get the vid on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's um we need to make sure we triangulate between Rab, um, Matt and Ryan and Justin because this whole education thing, I think you've met Ryan before, you've probably also met Matt before, but Matt's in the LAUSD and they're trying to figure out innovative ways to educate our youth beyond Zoom. So hopefully you guys can connect beyond this call. That'd be awesome. Sweet. All right, we're gonna shift gears here because Andrani's been moving around and I feel like- Andrani! I don't know if you 